we will have brief introductions. I will try to set the scene and then all the speakers will uh, speak for about five, six minutes. Then we'll have questions and then we'll, we'll summarize. Uh, Christopher very eloquently mentioned the, the costs of failure, which we are now living through. And it struck me there's one other cost I became aware of. I spoke in Austria to um, school children, actually 17 year olds, a few months ago. And the question came up, well, how can, are you still motivated to do all this work when you know, the world's going to end in December? And um, I realized that this, you know, Mayan prophecy, that they were actually taking this seriously. And I said to my son, who was 16, I said, do you discuss this in your school? Are you worried about it? He said, of course. And I noticed that now it's actually even reached the front pages of the newspaper here. Um, so, uh, you know, we have to be aware, what does this take? You know, we are taking away the hope, the, the, the future, because, you know, we are not discussing this anymore in the world which, you know, we assumed uh, until recently were uh, a world of steady progress, you know, where utilitarians discuss the common good, you know, for centuries, and it's best facilitated by, you know, helping the common cake grow faster. But uh, there's not much evidence that we're in a world where of global coming, global peak, everything. So issues of sharing and, and equity can no longer be ignored and you know, pushed into a, a future which may never come. Economic growth is not disappearing. It's just, to quote the American economist, it's becoming uneconomic growth. It's uh, no longer contributing to um, improving human uh, quality of life, but increasingly having to deal with the um, to, to repair and, and to prevent the damage caused by you know, past growth. And of course, environmental challenges uh, are not economic, they're not just economic, they are existential. At um, a conference um, last month, I was, I was horrified actually to hear Lord Giddens, you know, the climate policy expert, author of the politics of climate change, actually say that you know, if we continue like we are doing now, CO2 emissions, etc., then the planet risks becoming uninhabitable, he said, like Venus, within this century. And, you know, the conference continued, and it's quite, I'd one, one wonders what else do we have to hear to be, you know, prepared to, to change course. You know, temperatures predicted, which we haven't seen, which the Earth haven't seen in, in five million years. You know, so therefore, I think the first priority, when we talk about, you know, achieving common good, surely must be to avoiding the greatest possible common bad i.e. rendering our planet uninhabitable. Unfortunately, we can't start with one common value, because we all want, and you know, you could put this question in any part of the world, and people want to hand over a healthy planet to their children, one in perhaps, you know, preferably in better state, but certainly not in a deteriorated state. You know, Amartya Sen talks about human development being removing unfreedoms, and certainly, you know, the environmental constraints are now becoming the greatest unfreedom. So our key challenge is to, I think, to m make it understood that the common good is a governance issue, as we are discussing here. Uh, it's an issue of the rules, the laws, regulations, and institutions which societies set for themselves. It's not something which the market will solve by itself, but something which requires mobilizing the public spirit and our public sense of responsibility. Aristotle wrote that we become just by doing just acts, brave by doing brave acts, i.e. the common good was best advanced, he thought, by common practice. And in, in ancient Greece, there's a citizen who got involved in politics and public life was known as a politus. The citizen who refused to get involved in political and public life was known as an idiotus which I think is something we'll need to reflect on today. Jean-Jacques Rousseau warned that as soon as a public service ceases to be the chief business of the citizens, and they would rather serve with their money than with their persons, the state is not far from its fall. So it isn't enough to press the button on our computer and make a donation to some NGO. We actually have to get involved. Get involved in politics, get involved in public life, which doesn't mean more lifelong professional politicians. It means all of us as citizens, you know, going into public life, participating in public debates, helping to overcome this cynicism and distrust which has been fostered between societies and their governments. Otherwise, I don't think we have a chance. Because this distrust has, of course, been fostered for a reason. You know, the claim that we are best governed 
by the rules of economics, the best we can do is to vote in the market, i.e. to shop. And you probably know the story when after 9-11, when President Bush's mother asked her son, the president, what she could do for America, and he said, mom, just go out and buy, buy, buy. <laughs> now, in uh, the, the, uh, Levitt and Hoopner in their bestseller Free Economics, they claim that, quote, morality represents the way we would like the world to work. And economics represents how it actually does work. Now, you may say, well, you know, they are, this book is a bit of an exaggeration, but take Lawrence Summers, a man of huge influence, chief economic advisor to uh, Clinton and Obama, uh, um, chief economist of the World Bank, president of Harvard University, who says, we all have only so much altruism in us. Economists like me think of altruism as a valuable and rare good that needs conserving. You know, don't use it too much. And the economic historian Neil Ferguson quotes Edmund Burke's belief that the most important social contract is that between generations. But then, interesting enough, it's symptomatic that he uses Burke to criticize the monetary debts. His big concern is the monetary debts we're building up for the future generations. You know, how will they affect you know, their common good? But of course, money debts are a problem, but you know, they have often in history, they've been canceled, they've been rescheduled, they've been rejected, and that will no doubt happen again, and societies have survived. And uh, if you look at the recent paper by the Boston Consulting Group uh, called Back to Mesopotamia, they think that the only way out of this morass we're in is going to be a massive debt cancellation. So I, it's remarkable, you know, coming from, from I think, that, that group. So. Um, Environmental debts, on the other hand, you know, you can't reschedule. You can choose which financial debts you pay. Every generation can choose whether which obligations it honor, but it has no choice about its environmental obligations. Natural laws always trump economic laws. So for me, the key challenge now is how can we protect our future common good when our governments are ruled by economists who discount it away. And at, at even 2% discount, a 2% discount rate, 100% of GDP in, in 140 years time, 2,150, is worth 6% today. So for economists, it would be uneconomic to spend you know, more than 6% to save humanity from extinction, because with a GDP of zero, obviously, we can't survive in 2,150. And the economist Pavan Suktev, as you may know, was seconded from the Deutsche Bank uh, to work for UNEP, has said that discounting the future only makes sense if we think we're going to be richer in the future. But if we think we may be poorer in future, discount rates should be negative, valuing the future more. And you know, the challenges for that are, of course, massive. So I would argue that our current financial and monetary system is the, the greatest threat to our common good. And of course, everybody you know, wants to internalize costs from the left to the right. But the actual challenge of doing so is so massive because we have externalized costs for so long that um, if you try to do it, like the president of Nigeria tried recently abolishing you know, subsidies on petrol, you soon face, of, you know, you soon face with a revolution. And um, I'm therefore you know, very happy to have as our first speaker Chandra Nair, because you know, the argument we always meet is, well, these are nice discussions to have here in your rich countries, but of course, you know, the poor and the China, they don't care about this. They are just going to continue and emulating us and getting rich, and uh, you know, there's nothing you can do about it. And of course, there's nothing we would want to do about it if it was possible. But you know, Chandra has a distinction of po having pointed out that it is just not possible. And of course, an even greater distinction that he's managed to point this out in a way that he's being heard in China, and not just in China. I was in the uh, Abu Dhabi a few months ago, and uh, you know, opened the major paper there, and I found an article by Chandran which contained the sentence: "There is no human right to a car." And of course, there is no nothing in the Declaration of Human Rights about you know car ownership and you know flying to Mallorca for 20 francs or 20 euros or whatever. But you know, it's important to remind us of this. What, you know, we are, you know, we need, to, first of all, if we talk about the common good, we have to ground ourselves in the real world. And 
I think Chandran is the best person to start by giving us a brief global reality check. Chandran, please. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I was expecting to go last, actually. Um, well, firstly, I have to disclaim I'm not an economist. And that's not, that's in the, you know, the days of Wikipedia and Twitter, viruses get spread. So I want to disclose I'm not an economist. And that's not an apology, it's a badge of honor. So um, just to make that clear. Um, I thought what I would do is um, try and talk about global governance and the common good from uh, a question that bothers me very much, which is essentially the question of the geopolitics of common good. And so the geopolitics of common good, and, and I think it's time also to say, we have to question everything from Aristotle to Adam Smith, etc. With all due respect, everything I've read and heard, every name mentioned, has been a Western thinker. In every paper I've read so far, no one has mentioned anyone from Africa or Asia or anyone. There are lots of people thinking about these things, but the narrative is essentially a predominantly Western narrative. But as I open my mouth and say a few things, please do not think of me as being anti-Western or anti-American. That would be lazy of you. Okay, so my first point is that if you think about the geopolitics of common good, then we have a, v a couple of very, very important things to think about, which is what I think makes the 21st century the most unique in human existence. You will all know that the population of the human race for the first time in human existence will peak in this century. It's never happened before. It's like bacteria in a Petri dish. So we peak, what happens next, we don't know. But in this century, it's likely that more people will be added in the worst case scenario uh, to the population than there are people existing today. Maybe eight billion, okay? So that's the first thing that makes us very different. The second, of course, is the climate issue, which first time in human existence, temperatures will rise to a point where the climatic conditions under which human civilization for hundreds of thousands of years has existed and spread itself will dramatically change. So everything is up for grabs, everything changes. Thirdly, my view is technology. We have reached a point of technology overreach. We can go everywhere. I was dismayed to see a piece in the article that talked about the internet as, uh, as an intelligent common good. I would beg to defer. How much of the internet is pornography? Anyone know? I'm told 60%. Uh, um, so technology overreach, particularly with resources, is a major issue, and I, I won't go into the details about that, but you, you can all think what I'm talking about. But we all see the panacea that somehow technology will save us. Uh, this is a lie. And then lastly, the very important thing I think is happening in the 21st century is the unraveling of two, three centuries of the Western economic model uh, of consumption-led economic growth. And we're seeing it now taking place in, in tiny little Greece. It's just the, the, the forebearer of this unraveling. My point, point is that from the, Asia Pacific, uh, from the Asian point of view, the reality is that five billion Asians or six billion Asians in 2050 cannot and should not aspire to live like the average American. This is simply not possible. Yet we are being told that this is our future. And the entire global discussion about common good, et cetera, is how you can all have everything. We can't. This is very simple. Today's Herald Tribune, very interestingly, has an article about India and climate change. And all these Indians adding air conditioning units to their buildings, almost people horrified that all these Indians are going to do this. Well, they are, but not all of them are going to have this. And the halfway through this game is going to be catastrophic. So my point in terms of the geopolitics of the common good is ultimately the rights to resources. And in the paper that was distributed, people talked about happiness. Most people in this planet in the next 25 to 30 years are going to be unhappy, not by some definition of whether they have a flat screen TV or a mobile phone or have another iPad to app down more meaningless conversations with other people, but about the access to resources, which I call the fundamental right to live. Now, it's quite easy living in Europe, despite reading everything, to think the world is not a bad place. I mean, I come here and I think, this is nice. But this is sort of Disneyland, my friends. This is not the real world. And you're very lucky to be here. But this is not really the real world. The real world is somewhere else, which is extremely crowded, where the majority don't have the access to the most basics. Now, so I would conclude by saying, in my view, the narrative is not the Western narrative 
that, hey, you all can be like us if we do all of these things. The narrative has got to be something very, very much deeper. And since I've only got a couple of minutes left, I'll say the first one is the rejection of the Western consumption-led growth model that will somehow uh, accord rights to everybody to do whatever they want. This is simply not possible. So my throwaway statement that car ownership is not a human right. But try saying this in the USA, which I have, and they think I'm undercover Taliban. <laughs> OK? <laughs> and I left my turban at the airport. Uh, so you know, uh, this is simply, this is, these, these, are, these are lies. The second, the second one is, therefore, if we are in Asia to have this uh, relook at what is possible, then we have to going to redefine what prosperity means. And prosperity is not the ability to aspire to air-conditioned homes, lawns, TV sets, and cars. It's not going to be that. It's going to have to be a very different, different aspiration. We're going to have to define it. And finally, ultimately, and I will, it be, it's my view is everything is aligned to access to resources in the crowded parts of the planet. More Indians today, more Asians today have access to mobile phones than toilets. Think about this. The underpricing of things technologically to allow people to have this make-believe world. So we're going to have to reprice everything. And I don't think the Western world can lead this because of the nature of its recent history of privilege, entitlement, and economic dominance. And of course, its political systems, dare I say, democracy. So my point is we, we're not at the end of history. We'll have to have a more open conversation in Asia. The narrative cannot be one led by the West because it is an old narrative which is an ideological battle between the West and the rest. But the game of the minority is over. The majority must have a new, a new conversation. The problem is the, the majority in Asia and, dare I say, Africa are intellectually subservient to the narrative of the West because of two, three centuries of colonization, et cetera. All the books we read, we still believe in Adam Smith. So all of this has to be deconstructed. And all I think when we talk about the common good and global geo geopolitics is my contribution is to say, we can go down this way. Let's look at it in a different way. And ultimately, it's about how do we govern ourselves first. If China, India get this right, then we have a better chance than you know, Switzerland getting it right, or Holland, because ultimately that doesn't matter. The population of the West with the United States and Europe will be less than 10% of the global population. It will be irrelevant to the greater scheme of things. It's how those countries do it well. The problem is at the moment, they are seeking to ape the West. They'll be catastrophic for the common good at a global level and for the individual level. I'll finish off by saying that when I'm very cheeky, because I, I believe it's all about rules and institutions and therefore how we redefine rights. At this stage, I would rather be a poor Chinese than a poor Indian. I'll, ask you, I'll, I'll allow you to decipher what I mean by that, but happy to take questions. Thank you. It's always also fascinating to me to read um, the pronouncements coming out of the World Economic Forum from you know, Professor Schwab and seeing that here is this forum seen by many as the, the, the gatherings of the most powerful players of the current global order, um, but also um, coming out with uh, some of the most uh, profound and strong criticism and you know, speaking about the the, the unsustainability of our present economic you know, capitalist system, a very interesting uh, you know, combination, I would have thought. So I look forward very much to your contribution. Um, so what I'd like to start with maybe, it's just to add also, and, and I think it echoes well what has been said, around the new realities of, of what is impacting global governance. And one of them clearly is the rise of emerging markets and emerging economies. And they will require stronger and uh, stronger rules and global rules and cooperation. 
because they have, they're spreading their production, their access to resources, growing populations, etc. And we need to ensure a secure access to the markets that they're opening up. Um, but what we're seeing, uh, interestingly enough, is that these emerging new globalizers are really looking not so much towards global governance, but also, or maybe as a complement, towards regional governance. So we have seen a lot of regional strategies and an increased collaboration around the regions, which do not necessarily take part in the global structures. And with you know, some examples, for example, Botswana in 2009 turned to the African Development Bank, not to the World Bank, because they felt the World Bank was too slow to give them a loan. Um, ECOWAS has recently intervened in Mali, so, and of course we know what the African Union has been doing and, and the European Union, et cetera, but it's an interesting aspect that we think is, is gonna be important to consider as we talk about the global commons and global governance, because these new structures will need to fit into existing global governance structures and institutions, and we would like to make sure that they are incorporated and, and sort of complementary to those, those structures. One of the other things that I would like to mention, which is very clear but just needs more thought about how we deal with this, is the rise of youth and the power of the voice of youth. We've seen, obviously, all of us, the Arab Springs and the implications of that, but there's so much more youth can contribute when we talk about global governance and it's just an important need to, when we have these conversations and when we look to the G20 and, and Rio Plus 20 and other conversations that, that define what the world will look like, that we incorporate this next generation and their thoughts and their responsibilities as well. Um, I just wanna make sure this is really uh, in incorporated. And we at the forum have created just now a new community, which we call the Shapers, Global Shapers. And there, the population between age of 20 and 30, so very young, but all of them very accomplished and, and leading their own NGOs or having important positions in government and business or NGOs. And they uh, are now integrated with our conversations with global leaders. And we feel it's incredibly important to have them take part in those conversations and take on also ownership and leadership in driving some of the changes that we're talking about. And you know, voting in the right in, in the way that they feel they can make a change or, or impacting the future. Um, one of the other things that I'd like to highlight is, with that backdrop and the more interconnected world and you know, the the global crisis we've seen the last few ye years, which just cannot have this business as usual continue, is that we need to find new purposes which promote inclusive and quality growth. And I know there's a lot of talk about gro gro growth, but it really has to be more quality and inclusive rather than just economic growth for China or economic growth for certain individual countries, but it has to be more inclusive and with the global aspect. And it has to really go beyond just these concepts of triple bottom line and you know, how do we include the social aspect of it, but really also look at how do we incorporate deep systemic change, transformations, not just incremental changes that are reforms of existing outdated systems, which most emerging markets and youth do no longer trust in or believe in, but really transform the way we act, work, and progress. Um, and this will also, to the earlier points in the introduction, leads to changes in our personal beliefs and behaviors and the way we, we, have, we, we, we change our mindsets. And I think it's an important aspect, the values question. What kind of values do we wanna create for the next generation to deal with these global goods and global governance at, at large? And then just finally, what I wanna highlight is, it's interesting in the question that was raised about whether the concept of global governance or the common good still fits the 21st century. And I think the question is also, do the existing structures to govern common goods still fit? It's not just the concept of the, of the commons itself, but how we govern them. Does, is that still the right way to go about it? So, Soleika, with a background in 
civil society and in, in politics working in the German parliament. Strong uh, interest and concerns about financial, but also about social justice issues. What is your perspective? I take the common good as more or less shared aims and values. For example, ecological sustainability and social justice, but also democracy and human well-being. And as we are talking about global governance, I'd like to focus on three main points. It is funding, regulation, and democracy. I begin by the funding. Um, today, in a world of austerity, we are still in favor with private capital. And private capital can be very useful to push new technologies, green to technologies, um, clean tech, energy efficiency. Yet, especially for social issues or in economy as a whole, private finance is often in conflict with the common good. Since, of course, um, private capital only occurs if there is an economic outcome. And it comes and goes quickly. Um, it is not a sustainable source of finance, such as taxes. And take as an example public transportation in rural areas. There is no economic uh, substantial outcome, but it is highly important due to ecological and social reasons as well. So um, to sum up, private capital is useful, but for the common good, we need public funding as well. The question is, of course, how can the money come from in a world of austerity? So one uh, answer is just taxes, the distribution of the wealth we have. Wealth taxes, the financial transaction tax, and to overcome the really harmful tax competition and tax avoidance we have all over the world, in northern as well as in southern countries. There are already good proposals for the European Union, for instance, um, of tax cooperation, a common assessment basis for the corporate income tax and uh, yes, some good proposals for tax cooperation. A second means of public funding is just to create new money. And if we create new money by the IMF, by central banks, and this money is directly given against performance, such as the production of renewable energies in developing countries, there is no inflation to fear. So, so far for the funding. Um, next, regulation. There are many good proposals. I will just mention one uh, measure, which is very efficient, but has been avoided by the G20. This is a finance TÜV test as a licensing authority for new financial instruments. It would mean that um, a financial entrepreneur would have to prove that a new financial instrument is useful for the real economy. And what about the risk-reward profile? This would lead to an automatic shrinkage of the virtual financial sector. Lastly, democracy. It is really hard to come to a sustainable common agreement between countries under unfair conditions without democracy, under unfair power relations. And uh, the G20 is, of course, better than the G7, but it is still not the G192. And um, you have been talking about emerging economies, but developing countries, they are not represented in the G20. And to come to the World Economic Forum, you have to be invited. So the most democratic 
and the most representative institution we have today is the United Nations. Thus, we have to strengthen the United Nations. Also, social movements are very important to set the agenda in the media to contribute to the public opinion. Examples are um, shadowing activities when summits take place. For instance, we have the World Social Forum and also the Zermatt Summit versus the World Economic Forum. Yeah. Yeah, that's so far from my side. Thanks. Thank you. Right. Nicholas, you've already been introduced. You have a background in public service, but of course also especially in international law, which I feel will be very appropriate to what we're talking about. So I look forward to your contribution. Thank you so very much. So yes, I will try to uh, bring experiences from, uh, from this background. And um, in fact, I've decided to just simply address the two questions that, that are asked in the program. So the first one, what kind of global governance would have the best chances to foster human development and to provide for more than the satisfaction of our needs, meaning a general sense of personal fulfillment and collective achievement. Here I have just simply three idea, ideas to share with you. Uh, you will see they are really extremely uh, summarized, but I do hope that we can have some discussion about it. The first answer to the question would be, in my view, a government governance that takes into account a vision of the human being in line with the real nature of the human being, as I said before in my introduction. I, now, what does that mean? Uh, let me take the three dimensions of uh, the, the humanism that is the basis of uh, the vision of the common good. Let, me, let us take the social dimension of, of the human being. Now, I fully share with um, previous speakers what they said about solidarity in different ways. Now, what should remain really shocked at the huge gaps between the, the rich and, and the poor. It's not just simply uh, because uh, of, uh, I mean, the feeling of the heart. It's just because it is unreasonable to continue in, in, in this uh, way. Let's take the creative dimen dimension, the work and labor. You would find a number of people who find it just simply normal that in any given society, uh, there is some level of unemployment. Some people would, would just simply tell you, well, two, three, four, five percent is, is, is okay. But this is in direct contradiction with the notion of the common good, where you have to take into account each individual and his or her right to make a contribution with the talents he or she has received. Let's take the third dimension, the, the, the spiritual dimension. Now, these days, I will come back to that if I have a chance then to engage in a dialogue also with uh, Chandran on that, on, on that issue. Uh, look, look at uh, where religious freedom stands in a number of, of uh, countries these days. For, ex for example, there is a lot, a lot to do. And I'm definitely not sure that here the Western model is the, is the right model. I really do think that in other societies, a, the integration of the spiritual dimension has been uh, taken into account in a far, far uh, better way. So that would be my first answer. The second one would be a world community which is reflective of this vision of the human being. But this is too abstract. Concretely, what does that mean? The world, the current world order is, to put it in very simple and too simplified terms, based on how it was built after the, West, uh, the Peace of Westphalia. So this Westphalian order, which is based on the state, on the individual state, on the sovereign state. Now, uh, this is even true in, in the UN Charter. The UN Charter starts in its preamble with we, the, the, well, or the people, but immediately after, you see that the whole architecture is based on states. And the first principle that the organization and the member states has to have to respect is the sovereign equality of, of the members. So the whole system is built upon the sovereignty of, of states. Later on, I mean, in, in the 40s, 50s, etc., international organizations started playing a, gr a greater role. And we have started recognizing the individuals, the human being, as a subject of international law. But for scholars, for a long time, the only subject of international law was the, the state. 
So now we have to shift, I really do think that in international order, including and more specifically the international legal order, has to be built not on the principle of state sovereignty, but on the principle of human dignity. I'm not saying that states are not important. It is all too important to have states in place in various places. If you look at Somalia, for instance, other places, what happens when the state structures disappear, it is a catastrophe. So no, there's a need, of course, for organized states, but not as the sole actors uh, or exclusive actor in the international community. Third answer would be a world governance that recognizes the existence of a universal common good, as I said in my introduction, universal common good. So not only competitive national interests to be solved on the basis of relationships of power. Of course, I'm not naive. I know that this model will continue to play in the central role. I mean, of course, power will be important and the ability to, to, I mean, competition will remain important. But what, is, what are the implications of what I'm saying about world governance taking into account the universal common good? I see here to share with, share with you briefly three implications. First one is that the various needs of the human being must be addressed in a harmonized and coordinated way. If you look at the institutional setting of the international community today, what do you see? a huge fragmentation. You see, environment in Nairobi, if you have uh, labor in Geneva with a UN agency, commerce, it's not even a, human, uh, a, a UN uh, agency. You, you take well, the, um, uh, uh, or even the, the Bretton Woods organizations, all these elements are not really well coordinated. That gives really, frankly, not more the impression that the system is not coordinated not uh, uh, in line with the uh, objective of taking into account the human needs in a coordinated way. You take health, environment, commerce, peace, security, development, they are all being taken into account in a totally fragmented, well, very fragmented way, I would like to say. Uh, huge efforts have been made uh, at addressing this challenge, but we are far, far from governance structures that are adequate. Uh, other implications, the need to address simultaneously three fundamental needs. At least this is the, the, the vision of the, uh, the UN, the way Kofi Annan insisted on the occasion of uh, the uh, World Summit of 2005. He insisted on the three following pillars. First, well, you take them in the order that you prefer. Peace and security. Second, development. Third, rule of law and human rights. So you, c you cannot just simply say, I am in a, in, in a developing country, so to me, security is not important because security is what am I going to eat tomorrow or today? Or to say, no, security for me is a I mean, terrorist threat, so that's, that's about my security. And this is more important, of course, that development, I'll be able to take care of development once I live in, in security. Or other people just simply saying, well, no, in order for us to have an orderly community, there is a need for law, rule of law, not only at the domestic level, but also at the level of the international community, and rule of law with an essential component of human rights. Now, let me give you another implication of this vision of, of a world governance based of universal, on, on universal common good. It would be the need to consider the world community as a political society, as if you want, as a civitas, as a politeia, as a body politic, not just only as a gathering of sovereign states. And in these concepts, of course, not only states, but individuals in the private sector, civil society, individuals do have to play uh, a role. So we have to aim for a politically organized society at the world level. I'm not saying that we have to replicate the state model at the level of the international community, but definitely we cannot consider this community as just a set of separate interests to be coordinated apart from each other. And now the second question. Is the concept of the common good fit for helping to address the complex and interconnected challenges of the 21st century? You would be terribly surprised if my answer were no. Of course, yes. But, one, provided that it is understood that the human dignity, the principle of human dignity, is an essential component also of the common good. So we cannot address the common good without taking into account the legitimate needs, aspirations 
of the uh, human person. And an, another caveat, it's that the notion of the common good alone is not sufficient. Other fundamental principles have to be taken in conjunction with this one. First, and here I will come very close to what Chandran said before, first principle is, would need a lot of explanation, but is the principle of universal destination of goods. Goods were not made for an exclusive appropriation by a limited number of people. They were created for the whole humanity. So the notion of ownership has to be adjusted to this uh, uh, objective. Second, principle of subsidiarity. If you have a need for a world political order, of course, that does not mean that states do not have to play a role. On the contrary, political power has to be exercised as close as possible to the interested individuals, meaning that before uh, shifting responsibilities from the local community to the national community to the international community, there has to be an absolute need for this uh, shift in responsibilities. It wouldn't make sense to have a centralized uh, uh, political community at the international level. This would not respect the diversity of, of, of the world and the need for people to be able to participate in the decisions they are interested in. This is why the next principle after subsidiarity is participation. You mentioned democracy. We could term it in, in different ways. Of course, at different levels, participation is essentially. And the last one, as we said before, the last principle would be solidarity. So it's not a list of just principles, but these, these are elements for the thinking, for a coordinated thinking as to how to build a more just uh, uh, world community respecting the, the common good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, Christopher, will you handle the questions, or do you? Well, uh, the lights are pretty bright here. I think you may be able to see and recognize people easier. OK, so we would like to encourage some questions from the audience. Um, please. There's a, a micro on, on your left, and there's one here on the left and on the right. Thank you. Uh, hello. Um, I was just wanting to ask, uh, you mentioned the need to prevent, uh, to have developing economies understand the need to not try and sort of ape the Western economic model. However, my question is, the fundamental way a lot of Western governments go about trying to develop these developing uh, markets is through the IMF, the World Bank, to uh, lend them loans. However, a point that I've noticed is that this is a sort of a, there is a fundamental disconnect between this economic model of giving these developing nations loans and the outcome of this is a conflict of interest in that these, uh, the IMF, the World Bank, these uh, developed loaning agencies are still focused on that traditional bottom line, receiving interest on their loans rather than being focused on the uh, sort of sustainability, the financial well-being of the citizens of the country. Why should they be interested in the natural resources of a nation that they're not uh, in or the well-being of, uh, of the people that live in that nation? So my question is, should there be a more fundamental shift in the way Western developed nations go about bringing uh, economic development in these developing countries so that it prevents this conflict of interest of still wanting to receive uh, an economic benefit from investing in these countries. Well, well I, I would, is the mic on? Yes. Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, there's still a view in the West that they will help the rest of the world. Uh, they can't. So let's get this very clear. I mean. Uh, Nicholas Stern in the FT yesterday wrote a piece on climate change and said it's time the rich nations help the poor with um, clean energy technology. He's living in the past. Uh, but it's nice rhetoric because now you don't have money but you can have a higher moral ground. You can pretend. I mean, is the UK going to help finance any country in Africa on clean energy? I mean, they're broke. Right? So we, we need to be very clear about this, but of course the rhetoric is, is nice, it's appealing. Who, sent, who gave the largest amount of cash to the IMF last week? It was China. Okay. So we need to be very clear that 
we're still trapped in the old rhetoric. I don't want to get involved in a debate about you know, how the institutions of the World Bank, et cetera, are still essentially Western consensus, uh, because it sounds like I'm having a go at the West. But you will know that you know, the IMF chief uh, post came up, and they, you know, they made a concession. They made it a woman this time. And they said, you know, but European. Uh, and then the World Bank chief said, came up, and Obama played a little race card and made it a Korean American, you know, a little concession to the rest of us to think, hey, at least he's got a you know, non-white American guy. So, so we need to be very clear that this, the rest of the, 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 the at least in the Asia Pacific, very few people at a policy level take this stuff seriously. They play the game, they go, they attend these conferences, etc. But they, real, they know that there is a huge shift of economic power. With that shift of economic power, is going to become some new harsh realities. All I've tried to do in my little small way is get them to be emboldened enough to say you can challenge the orthodoxy of the trickle-down economics, which is in all the scriptures, I mean the books. Uh, there's been no other books written, by the way. So it's, it's an, and the best minds in Asia, and may, uh, dare I say Africa, where did they go and study all of this stuff? They go and study all of this in the, the Western schools. Intellectually subservient, we think, we need to go there, you know, that's a fountain of wisdom. That mo economic model is broken. Many people understand this, but you must understand intellectual subservience is deep in the psyche of those who have been colonized for three, four centuries. It will take time to unravel. Will that unraveling take place quickly enough for people to find new models? And therein lies the discussion then about economic model growth. The West can't help, I don't think so. It needs to be part of the debate. My thing, the biggest challenge for it is going to be not opposing change, which challenges its consensus. I'm sorry. The, the, the floor, it, it is for the audience, but just a word, uh, an, imp, uh, an important uh, thing that I wanted to say when I heard Chandran. I'm, I'm impressed by what he, he, said, he said last about how deeply rooted these perceptions are in, in the populations of, of various countries. But definitely one of the purposes of, of the Zermatt summit is to hear views like, like, like his. That's precisely the reason he is here, and we do hope that next year he comes back with a number of people saying similar things. So we are really far from intent on uh, promoting a predominantly Western narrative. And I am convinced that precisely the vision of the common good, the way I presented it, is universal. And, uh, and, and, and when you said, for instance, just to, to, to put a slight caveat, that geopolitics of the common good these days are access to resources, I indicated what the, the meaning of universal destination of goods is in that sense. And I am quite sure that you will not consider that the poli policy of China towards the access of resources is the best possible model to be uh, 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 replicated by others if you look at what is happening in, in, in Africa or in other countries. Yeah, so the Chinese didn't go to Africa with armies and holy men. I mean, the Chinese haven't gone to Africa with guns. We need to be very careful about demonizing the Chinese so early. I mean, and China will maybe make mistakes, but we need to be careful. Africa was decimated by colonization by Europeans. Now the Chinese are there, no guns, not yet we hope, no priests, no missionaries. Let's see what happens. Those of us who talk to the Chinese say, you better be very careful, and time will tell. But resources will fundamentally shape the world. But in Asia, and I'm talking too much, but I'll shut up soon. In Asia, what has happened, the debate today is the US policy on using Asia at its new pivot. You all heard of this. What is that about? It's about controlling resources. So the Chinese are wondering what, what this game is all about, too. Shouldn't only focus on loans and charity. Uh, we need to focus on rights and fair financial burden sharing as well. Since uh, common goods or responsibilities are common but differentiated. Some countries have climate debt, so they should uh, pay more via global taxes, for instance. Thanks. I think we have a question from uh, Henri Claude and Pierre Morel. Well, yeah. My question is to Chandran. I think, Chandran, it, it's quite appropriate to have you at the beginning of uh, 
meeting like this one on the, on the common good. Uh, I would like you to develop a little bit further. What are the implications for Europe? And you mentioned Switzerland, but for, for Europe, uh, given what you have said about uh, China and India uh, catching up and trying to have the same standard of living or the same lifestyle that we have in the West, and you said that is a non-starter, which I would agree. But what are the implications for the Europe? What should we Europeans do in order to contribute in our own way, in our own lifestyle, in our consumption pattern? What should we do in order to alleviate the consequences of the gap that you mentioned? <coughs> You know, I, I, I don't know if I can advise Europeans, but my, my view is that you maybe have to be prepared for two, three decades of a very harsh readjustment. The readjustment that's taking place today, which is muddled up in financial and monetary fiscal mumbo jumbo, is a much more simple readjustment. It's essentially the fact that after three, three centuries of having access to the world, resources, today two, three billion Chinese and Indians want it too. Therefore, everything changes. And therefore, what is happening is essentially the start of a readjustment to a less resource intensive because it's, it's to do with how you live beyond your means and, and, and more energy efficient. My, my hope is, and I've written one or two pieces on it, is that European politicians will accept the reality that it's an ideological reality they have to accept and not oppose other governments in the developing world who might do things differently, particularly around the notion of democracy and freedom, because things will have to be different in the rest of the world. You know, restricting cars will be a reality in most of Asia, and then I think the narrative starts to become ideological. So not to oppose that, but perhaps listen more rather than lecture. Um, I'm, I'm ready to enter and I continue with the Chandra uh, point uh, to, to take uh, fully on board the change of narrative. Uh, at the same time, you said yourself there has been a change of power and uh, of course China is the best example. But China, what did China? It took more or less the Western model to the full, to the square, to the cube. And uh, so for the time being, they are doing what we have been doing and are even telling us let us pollute because you have polluted for one century. So I, I don't see the change of paradigm. I would be ready. I think lots of people would be ready for a change of paradigm, but for the time being, this is not the logic. This is kind of retaliation, almost. So fine, there's no, I, I, I tried to, to catch what we hear in uh, certain kinds of debates. So it's part of, of, of the background we hear. Uh, let us have our coal uh, plant uh, each, uh, uh, each week anyway. Uh, so, uh, yes indeed, it's very important. I've spent six years in China. I'm fully aware of the fact uh, uh, that they have a potential. But what I see from uh, the absence of debate in China, because everything is uh, coordinated from the top, there is no search for a change of paradigm. Here and there, yes, you have the rules about and restriction on cars will come, but I don't see the change of paradigm for the time being. And that's my question. Not from the uh, uh, Western countries who I think got the message from, uh, uh, let's say, Copenhagen and other uh, occasions. Fine. Uh, just an additional point about the missionaries and the soldiers in, uh, in Africa and so on. I mean, uh, I do note in Africa in the last years just demonstration by local trade unions about the stealing of jobs by Chinese companies. 35,000 Chinese, even more, had to be evacuated from Libya. Well, that's the Libyan uh, thing, that's uh, their, 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 their choice and so on. But I mean, this is a, a wider problem I also see in Central Asia. And the extension of farming, and of course, uh, coming with new, uh, their, their own expansion. That's uh, their way, and I don't recognize another paradigm than a very well-known one. I forgot each speaker to, to just say a few words because we have... Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Pierre Morel, Special Representative uh, uh, of the European for Central Asia. Thank you. Uh, I think we have some questions. Martin Wilde and uh, Sister Alfred. Yeah, Martin Wilde from Uniapark Europe and PKU in Germany. Um, I think the narrative is changing slowly. Um, I have been working in Africa for a couple of years. I'm married to a 
lady from Africa, and it was very funny that uh, last year, or two years ago, when Greece uh, had to had get to uh, get, get supported by by the EU and the IMF, she told me, referring to the highly indebted poor countries initiative, HIPIC, which is a common acronym in, in, in Africa and Ghana, she told me, oh, Martin, I never knew European countries can also go HIPIC. And, and that showed me that there's really a shift uh, going on. When we talk about the common good and democracy, uh, I think we not only have to talk about um, this, the West and the rest, we also have to look how the situation in each of the countries is. And as long we have so-called elites in, in some, in almost all of African countries at least, who are in um, connivance with uh, elites in Europe or in China now, it is very difficult to really get the participation uh, to the grassroots people. And if we talk about democracy in the UN, sorry to say it, but that is laughable. I mean, one billion Chinese are not de democratically represented in the UN and in many the millions. The most so democratic institution we have, it's not the best. <laughs> yeah, but I want to say that if, if, if the members have not internal democracy, yeah. then they don't carry any democracy to the UN. Yeah, so we should, we should have that in mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last word to, uh, so, so I think the issue of how can we um, support grassroots participation, self-organization of, of the real poor, for instance, in rural Africa or somewhere else. I think that is important because otherwise the common good will be meaningless. And I think it's all about empowerment of, of, of those people. And one last word to China. Yes, there are no Chinese soldiers in um, Africa, but there are Chinese tanks in Tibet. And there are Chinese tanks and guns and prisons and concentration camps in many parts of what we call China, but which is a colonial power by itself, sorry to say it. I think that is a truth we should always be clear about. China is the biggest colonial power of today. Can I, can I, 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 I just for the interest of this debate, I'm not an apologist for China, but please be very careful how your fear of China is translated into demonizing a very complex and old country. They are, I, I spent a lot of time in China. Two weeks ago, I was at a major conference in China with some of the, the most, most clever policy makers in China. They are all thinking about this. Because they don't speak English and they're seen as commies, the Western media doesn't give them any space. Please be careful. They do have this discussion. There are huge problems in China, but no one says that, you know, in Asia there are more military bases and tanks of the United States of America than China, that, than China has, or of India, or of Indonesia. Please be, be a bit more careful how this narrative is conducted. Thank you very much. I think we had one question, Sister Alfred. Thank you. My name is Sister Helen Alford. I'm in uh, Rome, in one of the Pontifical Universities. Uh, I wanted to say I thought the structure worked very, worked very well in the panel because I felt that what uh, um, Nicolas Michel said at the end, in a way, opened a way forward for all of the speakers. Um, I think the idea of trying to reconstruct the international order, for starting from human dignity, has a lot of potential. Because somehow or other, we have to find a basis which is common to all humanity. I take very much the point that Chandran said that we keep referring to Western thinkers and Western philosophers and that kind of thing. At the same time, we have to find some kind of basis point for the whole of humanity if we're going to build a universal common good, if we're going to build this civitas between us all. And I think human dignity is one possible basis for it to be discussed. But I think we need to be talking at that level. Uh, I think uh, rethinking the state is essential. Uh, it's certainly in terms of regional structures, in terms of youth. Um, also, I think if we start from human dignity, we have the chance to much more bring in state structures again after 30 years of uh, the Thatcher revolution, the Reagan revolution, looking totally at economics. So I think um, most of the issues that you brought up come, come to the fore if we try to start from human dignity. 
The only thing I would like to say is I'd like to add two other little bits to what was said, I think, in that very good first session and in what uh, Nicolas has said in his uh, uh, presentation. First of all, I think that we're used in thinking about human beings to think of them as having two dimensions. We usually think of it as spirit and body or something like this. Uh, I think if we can think more in terms of uh, individual and relational, which comes out of an important philosophical tradition called personalism, uh, we have a way of thinking about both individual interest and common shared objectives because we have both of these dimensions recognized in the human being. And I think what uh, Nicolas said at the beginning, that we have to start from an anthropological vision is essential. We have to find an anthropological vision that can combine both competition and cooperation. And I think if we can recognize these two dimensions, human being, we have that starting point. The other thing I'd like to say, final thing, is this idea of good. What does good mean? We've talked about common so far. Uh, and I think here we have a chance to link the social, economic, and environmental issues under one term because I think the classical idea, sorry, I know this is a Western idea, but I bet we could find something in Confucius that is similar to this. And, and many people have worked on comparing Aristotle and Confucius, uh, as, a, as I'm sure many of you know, um, that good is about realizing the potential of beings. So it comes back to starting from what's natural, what's in our nature, which of course links us back immediately to environmental thinking. So I think, just to finish, John Maynard Keynes says, nothing more practical than a good theory. I think these underlying ideas that have been brought out so well in this first session are essential for dealing with all the practical issues that have come up in this panel too, which of course are very, very pressing and much more pressing than the theoretical ones in that sense. But without the theoretical ones, we can't properly deal with those practical ones. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have one question here. <laughs> Jürgen, yeah. can you present um, yourself? Jürgen Hempel, uh, we had to introduce ourselves, so I was wondering what I was going to say. We um, built houses in natural materials, so they don't need <coughs> any uh, synthetic uh, regulation whether in summer or winter on whether we are in Europe or in Africa or in China. Um, I would like uh, just to say to the last speaker that who asked for what is a common good, what is good, good is the opposite of bad. And then I would like to go back to what was said a little earlier about the uh, predictions of the end of the world. Uh, exactly six months from now, uh, the Aztecs and the Mayas didn't predict the end of the world. They predicted a great change in the world, which uh, bad news if we only have six months, but good news because what we need today is a change. And uh, coming back also to what Jakob said a little earlier, there are two big obstacles to this. One is political, and the other one is financial. And my question is really, how come if they are not living up to the standards, if they are not taking social responsibilities, what stops us from removing them? The, uh, it makes me think of uh, a Finnish philosopher and ma mathematician who once said that when an element is in disequilibrium, then it will either collapse or it will find its equilibrium again. And then he said, no, there's also a third possibility, and that is that you inject so much energy and so much uh, maybe blood or sweat or money into keeping this element in this disequilibrium into a permanent, continuous uh, voyage through the world. And I think that politics, our political system and our financial system has reached exactly this point. And I would like just at the beginning of this conference to make this point because I think that uh, trying to make bricolage or patchwork on what exists today is not going to bring the very noble objectives of this conference very far. 
we need a substantial change and maybe removal of elements that are stopping us from building a better world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jürgen. I will, give, I will give the floor back to Jacob for the conclusion because we, are, uh, we still have a few minutes left. Yes, Thank obviously you. I can just touch on a very, very few points. I think there is a, a difference between the shift of economic power uh, to the East, which has happened and is happening, and the claim that this is a shift to a different model. That I don't see. The, uh, the African Development Bank and other such banks are developed according to the, the Western model, the Western model of uh, finance, of money creation. And I would advise you to look at the new report uh, by the Club of Rome Brussels chapter by Bernard Liotard, others who mentioned, for example, that if that in France they passed a law in 1973 which changed the way the French state financed itself. Before that, it could finance itself by creating money, basically by printing money. And as was said before by Soleka, if you only do that against performance, it's not inflationary. It's not the way you create money which is inflationary. And that was changed. And if that law had not been passed, according to the calcula their calculations, the French national debt would today be about one-tenth of what it is at the moment. So, a, you know, a simple change like that, you know, creating money as debt, you know, has led to the situation we have now with the austerity, with a huge youth unemployment, and as, as you know from many countries, if youth unemployment goes up above a certain figure like we had in Somalia, in Bosnia, etc., you have, you know, civil war and collapse. The other point, I think, is the future of democracy. I'm not at all convinced that democracy will survive this coming crisis. And I was interested to see in, in, in Chandran's book that he had a quote by somebody in connection with the environmental crisis, sort of qu questioning whether our democratic system could, could survive this. And then I looked up who this quote was from, and it was from somebody who uh, this was published from a paper published by the Heinrich Böll Foundation of the German Green Party, party which is known to be completely committed to you know, grassroots democracy. But even there, you know, they are finding doubts about uh, this, this viability. And you know, unfortunately, the Western model has percolated and the, the vision has percolated so far. I had a discussion with a, the president of, of, of Maldives last year, the, the one who is actually now the president, he was then the vice president. And I said, but you know, I don't need air conditioning here. You, well, you, you need the fan. You don't need a, you know, proper air conditioning. Same thing in India. He said, but if I told my people that, that you can't have you know, modern air conditioning, I would not stand a chance of being elected again. So I think this is where, as long as you know this model is seen as our model, you know we are not going to be able to to you know to change it there until it's um, uh, and until it's too late. But I would um, very much like to hear the concluding remarks now of our speakers. Should we do it in the reverse order? Um, Nicholas, would you like to be first? Oh, uh, very quickly. First of all, I think that some of the aspects of the common good are better respected in Africa uh, or in, in Asia, like the sense of community or the integration of the spiritual dimension, definitely. So in that sense, the, the, the Western model is certainly not the best, uh, the, the best one. Now, I think that when it's about uh, governance, we need to think also not only uh, uh, of the change that is needed, but how to bring about this change. And here, one model that fascinates me is the, the famous Jean Monnet methodology. So I'm wondering, what is the Jean Monnet methodology for the international community? So, of course, it is to have a long-term, clear objective. But as a lawyer, I would like, not ob obviously, to create institutions and rules. But we have seen with the Conseil de l'Europe, the uh, uh, Council of Europe, that it does not work this way. If a society is not prepared to receive institutions and rules, it does not work. So the way to address it is to select short-term, decisive objectives where people work together and to create a dynamics that will, in turn, generate the needs for institutions and rules. And I think that we have to think in terms of, of how to create these dynamics because if that does not happen, the only way, I'm sorry to say, for a fundamental change to happen will be a terribly fundamental crisis. Because if the crisis we have experienced is not sufficient for people to want to change the model, then we are in a serious trouble. Common goods are useful as a first step because it is a first step to agree upon uh, shared aims and values. 
but uh, common goals are not just for textbooks and lyrics, but for implementation, and therefore we need fair financial burden sharing, democratic institution building in the countries and between the countries, and binding rules instead of just gentlemen's agreements. Yeah, so I, I think it's, it's clear that globalization is more often a, a force for good than it is not. So it's, it's just important to incorporate the rising powers, and by this I mean emerging markets and new globalizers, but also developing countries into a global governance system that really fo fosters open trade and free flows of capital and, and seeks to address global challenges jointly and the, the, the challenges of global commons. Um, but it also involves maybe to rethink these models and maybe the consensus driven model that we have seen in the past needs to be adapted and rethought with these new realities that we're seeing. Uh, okay, I mean, if, if the common good essentially boiled down, student, I think we all agreed to some form of definition of human dignity and that from my point of view is access to the basic rights to live, which is water, food, sanitation, basic housing, electricity, and public health, then I would argue that the current economic model, I will not say the Western, uh, will not provide for human dignity going forward. It cannot. And therefore, the rest of the world, and I only talk about where I come from, will have to reject that, redefine that, redefine the notion of freedoms, democracy, capitalism, and the narrative. We're not at the end of history. We need to talk very differently. And whether we like it or not, that part of the world has a majority of human beings. The decisions they make, whether they are right or wrong, will shape the 21st century. And we have to be very cognizant of, of that. And I talk about economic activity being subservient to maintaining the vitality of resources with a fundamental political objective. Secondly, that collective welfare takes precedence over individual rights. Uh, but the individual is not king. Uh, and thirdly, that resources must be repriced and therefore redefinition of productivity, which is, uh, which is an economic debate. But that's, and I'm sorry if I've been controversial, but um, that's how it goes. Thank you. I think this controversy <laughs> is actually exactly what we need because we need to provide something, and I hope we've succeeded in doing that for the next two days, which gives those from the, the, the business sector and those from the educational sector some meat, you know, because clearly policies start. Policies set the incentives, the wrong or the right incentives for societies, for innovators, for, for markets, and policies are based on values. But how you get from the values to the policies and to the implementation is, of course, a challenge we all face. But I think it is encouraging to, to know that, you know, it, this is, the awareness is there, even where you might least expect it. So I'll c close with a, with a quote from the, Financial Times a couple of days ago, when asked if they believe the financial sector takes its social responsibilities seriously enough, 67% of alumni working in finance answered negatively. This figure was 86% among those employed in the broader economy. Thank you. <laughs>